All right. On the line, I have uh, Janet Mefford from the uh, Janet Mefford Show, and I've invited her on Fighting for the Faith to come and talk about uh, the latest Mark Driscoll controversy uh, regarding his uh, being a New York Times bestselling author and uh, the wake of destruction that's uh, <laughs> happened as a result of how that is uh, happening. So, uh, Janet, thanks for coming on uh, Fighting for the Faith. Oh, Chris, it's my honor. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so this is a uh, you know the second major uh, scandal regarding Mark Driscoll in just a few months, and um, let me ask you this question: as a journalist and as a Christian, so you might actually consider uh, you know answering this question two different ways. Why are the two latest Driscoll scandals important? I mean, there's the, the people I've talked to, and I, I get a lot of flack from people on, out on social media basically saying, you know, listen, this doesn't matter. It's not that big of a deal. Um, why do you think this is an important story? Well, I think both of the scandals are important stories, primarily because this speaks to a terrific corruption uh, in the ministry of Mark Driscoll, I mean, if you look at First Timothy chapter three and Titus chapter one, which speaks to the qualifications of elders and pastors, one of those qualifications is being beyond reproach, above reproach. And so, when we're looking at what's happening here, first of all, on the plagiarism issue, the fact that Mark Driscoll has now been shown to have plagiarized or improperly cited in, I think it's up to seven books now. I had uncovered four, mm. but there were three additional that I believe uh, were Warren Throckmorton's uncovering. Um, you know, that is an incredible story in and of itself. It's also been shown that he has plagiarized in a Tim Keller sermon, and from what I understand, there may be more of that coming out. Um, but it speaks to a lot of issues. Primarily, it speaks to an integrity issue. Um, when I had Mark Driscoll on my show and I was talking to him about his plagiarism, I had pointed out, you know, Romans 2's admonitions that are you preaching to people not to steal and you steal? And that was exactly what he did. He has, on his frequently asked questions portion of his website, he talks about uh, the, the, the whole issue of plagiarism, and if you use Mark's sermons and you don't cite it, that's plagiarism. So he's very tough on people who he thinks are plagiarizing him, even went after a church at one point that was using the Mars Hill logo and then mm -hmm. subsequently dropped that. But he was being completely hypocritical. He was telling people not to plagiarize while he was doing it himself. He wasn't honest about it when he was on my show and doing the interview. He was not honest about it. Um, and it's plagiarism, and a lot of people say that plagiarism, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. It's lying. It's stealing. It's fraud, and for him it's also hypocrisy, and it speaks to an integrity issue, and it also speaks to something that will get you fired if you're a journalist or if you're in academia for much, much less than this guy has done. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing on the plagiarism issue. On the issue of spending $210,000 at least to put your, your plagiarized book, Real Marriage, on the New York Times bestseller list, again, that's an integrity issue. It's a cover-up issue because... Most of his church didn't know what was going on, and it just speaks to pride. It speaks to arrogance. It speaks to, I want my book to be seen as a bestseller, to make me look better, to be able to sell more books and continue the whole, you know, promoting myself thing. It, 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 fundamentally, Chris, I really think it comes down to a character issue. Right. And is this man really qualified, biblically speaking, to be a pastor of a church that claims to preach Jesus Christ. That's what people in Marcel have got to decide for themselves. But from my vantage point, it's pretty darn clear he's not qualified. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to disagree with your opinion. You know, uh, some of the criticism I've received, you know, the, the people have come out of the woodwork and said, listen, why are you making such a big deal about the $210,000? It was a marketing expense. They were marketing the book. I mean, do you see this as just a, a marketing expense? And you know, keep in mind, it was Mars Hill that actually, you know, paid this uh, this resource marketing company to make him a New York Times bestseller. And so the issue of uh, you know where where did the monies come from? Was it through ties and offerings and stuff like this? Is this a legitimate marketing expense? No, it's completely unethical. And if you go back, you can Google this article. I know I've put it up on social media and others have as well. Forbes magazine did an article on Result Source and on this issue of buying your way onto the New York Times bestseller list. They called it a laundering operation. This is not marketing. Marketing is you put out press releases, 
you try to get interviews for your book, you try to get publicity for your book, so people will legitimately go out and be interested in the book and buy it organically. Marketing is not taking hundreds of thousands of dollars and secretly ensuring that people buy it to, uh, to put you on the New York Times bestseller list. It's, it speaks to the lameness of the book, not to the greatness of the book, because it's cheating. It's just completely unethical. Right. Yeah, I, I don't see it as a valid marketing expense at all. I mean, I've actually, you know, been a marketing executive, and you know, the, the, you, you don't engage in underhanded, shady, uh, you know, unethical uh, means to market something, and, and unless, of course, you have no conscience. Um, right. Then let me ask you this, okay? Um, yesterday, I, I, I've noticed on your uh, on your Twitter feed, you've really uh, kept up with a lot of the different. Uh, news stories that have come out regarding this, as well as blog posts and things like that. Yesterday, the Christian Post reported that Driscoll had an apologetic tone. This is a direct quote. Had an apologetic tone during his Sunday sermon. Um, isn't that enough for him to have an apologetic tone? I mean, clearly, I mean, he's super sorry, and he had an apologetic tone. What do you think of that particular post and the video that they linked to, you know, which demonstrating that uh, Mark Driscoll had an apologetic tone? I think the Christian Post is turning into Pravda, first of all. Um, the, the, the sermon, it's, a, it's just becoming a PR uh, vehicle for Mars Hill Church. I mean, they were the same site that had run something about Mars Hill donating coats to the homeless during the whole plagiarism scandal. Um, <laughs> one of the, it's true. I wish it weren't true, but it, it actually is true. Um, this issue of him having an apologetic tone, first of all, from what I have been told... Mark Driscoll didn't even show up in his church on Sunday to preach in the wake of this scandal. So it wasn't that he had an apologetic tone on Sunday after the results of our scandal broke. It was, it was a link to other sermons that he's done. They did not do any substantive coverage of the results of our scandal. They mentioned it, and then they just kind of went on and gave a one-sided, basically, press release on behalf of Marshall Church, if you take out that one paragraph talking about the, um, the scandal itself. So I... I there hasn't been coverage. And that, you know, Chris, that's another thing, a complaint that I've got. I think that the Christian media, except for World Magazine, and, and, and I'm speaking like some of these news sites that are supposed to be covering Christian news, I think they have done a lousy job on this story. I think the Christian media largely has dropped the ball on this story, both of these stories, and I think that that speaks to um, something that is maybe even more troubling than what we've been talking about, because... Every Christian ought to be outraged and scandalized by what Mark Driscoll has done, both with the plagiarism and with the results source story. The fact that you're having to read about it uh, after World broke it, God bless them, they did a fantastic job, but you have to read about it in the L.A. Times and the Seattle media. You know, where is the Christian media on this? I, I, we're doing it, you're doing it, Chris, um, and I'm doing it on my show, but where are the rest of them? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> The, the the thing that is troubling for me, um, and there's actually on a lot of different levels, this this story and the repeated scandals with Driscoll. Now I've been covering Driscoll for for years now, and I just look at the plagiarism scandal and the New York Times scandal as just two of the latest scandals regarding Driscoll. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he was disqualified from being a pastor years ago, and that and the nail in the coffin should have been the fact that he was uh, driving the getaway car at Elephant Room 2 and trying to smuggle uh, T.D. Jakes into the evangelical mainstream um, and, and declare his uh, doctrine of God to be okay when it's not. I mean, Jakes was playing games. And you know, he admitted that he believes in the doctrine of the Trinity, at least God in three persons, if by persons you, need, you mean manifestations. And anybody with theological training knows that he's playing games and, and is basically trying to have his cake and eat it too and wasn't confessing the doctrine of the Trinity. He didn't repent of that. Um, and then you know, I think back to you know, a few years ago when uh, it was actually leaked to us, a link to the audio of uh, him telling a group of pastors that there's a pile of bodies behind the Mars Hill bus, and with God's grace, it'll be a mountain before he's done. I've never heard a pastor yeah. say anything like this, and yet right. there's, there's, I've never seen any repentance on his part, and I, I, I don't see any way in which he, the man is qualified to be a pastor, but it's worse than that. He's actually uh, marketing himself for years now as a pastor to pastors. He's a leader to leaders, and so he's been busy over the past decade 
creating little Mark Driscolls who are church planters and, and pastors all across the country, and I don't see that that is a good thing at all. I, it really, really worries me. I mean, what do you think about the idea of having Mark Driscoll clones all over the country basically buying into his leadership methods and his, and his accountability um, structure? Ugh, it's scary. <laughs> it's really scary. And you know what, Chris, what really is disturbing about it is it ends up changing what the world thinks Christianity is. Yeah. And that may be the biggest scandal of all, because it's become so widespread. You know, I was watching a, a video last night with some uh, celebrity pastors in it, and I just shook my head in, in absolute despair, because the way these people, I was really looking at how the people were acting in the audience, and I, I say audience explicitly, <laughs> intentionally, I say audience instead yeah. of congregation. There is such a worship mentality, not of Jesus, yeah. but of the guy. And that's the disease of the age, and it is killing us. It is absolutely killing us. I'm old enough to remember the era before the celebrity pastor. And, boy, uh, you know, things have sure changed over the years, but not for the better. It's not about the Word of God and the supremacy and the sufficiency of the Word of God over us directing us what we ought to be doing to obey the Lord. It's about the celebrity, and the celebrity can do no wrong. That's the disease that we're all infected with, and those of us, like you, Chris, who are standing up and saying this is wrong, often become the villains. Yeah. It's not the guy doing the lying and the stealing and the fraud and the hypocrisy and the greed. He's not the problem, Chris. You're the problem. I'm the problem. We're the bad guys. We're the ones who need to be shut down, and we're the ones who are being ungodly. And everything is upside down. It's it's awful. It's really, really awful to behold. Yeah, and and yet Scripture is so clear on this. What the, the, I mean, there's the, when it comes to the office of pastor, and biblically it is described as an office, and God is the one who calls people to that office, and there's specific duties that go with that office. And what these guys have done is, is on both counts regarding the qualifications to be a pastor, there are moral qualifications that speak to the character of the man, and there are doctrinal qualifications that speak to the message that's to be preached by the man in that office. And, uh, and so many times with these celebrity pastors, number one, they do not meet the moral qualifications or they, mis they morally disqualify themselves, you know, and, and yet nothing is done, and doctrinally, nobody cares. It doesn't matter yeah. if they're scratching, itching ears. It doesn't matter if they're twisting God's Word. What, all that matters is that they're able to draw a large crowd, and everybody points to that and see, say, see, they're building the kingdom of God. Look at your dinky little church of 100 people. You guys are the problem. He's the solution because he's able to draw a large crowd, and they don't understand yeah. that Number one, the people who are show the crowd that's showing up to hear this man, they're not hearing the gospel. Number two, the man who's preaching whatever it is that's being preached in those churches, he's not even morally qualified to be a pastor anyway, and it doesn't matter. And I'm convinced at this point with Mark Driscoll that even if he were caught sleeping with a prostitute, he would blame it on somebody else and his board of, of accountability advisors would find a way to spin it. You know, and basically say, oh, he had a momentary lapse of judgment, uh, but we appreciate the way that he's, that he's conducted himself during our investigation, and, and we can see his heart, and we believe that there's going to be a great, uh, you know, harvest of souls, uh, you know, as a result of his, of his apologetic tone or something like that. I, I think we're to that point. Yeah. Well, it, it speaks to the antinomianism of our day. Um, I hear this all the time. If some big celebrity does something that is unbiblical or, as you said, morally disqualifies him from ministry, the first word out of the mouth of their followers is grace. Don't you believe in forgiveness? Don't you believe in restoration? I mean, now that he's done something wrong, God can really use him. And what I would say to that is that's not biblical. First of all, yes, there's grace. Yes, there's forgiveness for the repentant, sorrowful sinner. Right. There's repentance for the, the, the repentant Sinner, not the sinner who says, I'm stonewalling, I'm not going to speak to it, I'm not going to apologize, I'm going to justify it, I'm going to hide behind the skirts, like Driscoll has done, of the publishing companies and of my board of accountability, and I'm going to run away, when it, like brave Sir Robin, when it's time to show up at my church on Sunday to preach. That's not repentance at all. I mean, this guy, back to the plagiarism thing, he came out in December through Tyndale House. 
He didn't come out on his own and say, I'm sorry. He said mistakes were made, and I take responsibility for one book. There are six others he has said nothing about. His board has said nothing about. These people are not being accountable to the people. It's, it's you know, and the people, honestly, I, and I've had people say this, Chris, to me, which is you wonder how much the celebrity pastor phenomenon really is a judgment on the church rather than a sign of grace. Yeah. And the reason people have said that is you say people who sit there and listen to this and yet own Bibles, presumably, and have Google searches available on their Internet, and sit there under somebody like that and excuse away all the stuff you've mentioned before and just go, oh, you know, he's a cussing pastor, that's fine. Oh, he has porno visions, that's fine. Oh, he's just kind of edgy. He's irreverent. Isn't that cool? We're going to reach the culture. And eventually it comes to bite you, because if you overlook character issues, those things don't go away. They just ramp up. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know. It, it's, it's a difficult thing to speak to, but it is definitely uh, uh, definitely something we need to grieve about. I really think so. Yeah. I, I, you know, my concern is, you know, as I read the Olivet Discourse, you know, Jesus talks about in the last days that because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many would grow cold. And I think lawlessness uh, is like the word that captures the zeitgeist of today's major mainstream evangelicalism. There is absolutely no concept of sin, sorrow for it, repentance, and Christ bleeding and dying for it. Everybody's so caught up in this, you know, that Jesus is your buddy and he's about ready to reveal your grand purpose for your life, as if that's some, you know, making a decision to discover your purpose is somehow uh, synonymous with repentance and the forgiveness of sins. We've lost sight of the, of the true message of the gospel, and we've lost sight of the real Jesus who really bled and died to save us from slavery to sin, death, and the devil, and we're, and all these celebrity churches are growing at the expense of the truth rather than because of it. Well, and what happens, and I've said this about the church growth movement for a long time, when you have people raised in an environment who really don't know the Word of God because they're not taught the Word of God expositionally week to week in some of these churches, not all, but some of them, they're not doing expositional preaching, then what happens is these people don't develop any biblical discernment. (laughs) And it's kind of a catch-22 if you don't have a biblical discernment to discern when something is off because you don't know the Word of God well enough, then it's a perpetuating cycle. And that's That's the tragedy of it all. It's a perpetuating cycle. People go, well, the guy in front of me is talking about Jesus. He's quoting from the Bible. What's your problem? He's talking about getting right with God. Okay, well, but you got to go a little bit more deep than a millimeter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, it, it, the uh, the board of accountability for uh, for Mars, you know, for Driscoll and Mars Hill, um, regarding this New York Times scandal, they said that unwise decisions were made. That this was an unwise decision. And you know, when I read their statement on Friday night, the the thing that came to my mind and and I the, uh, was the immediate parallel to uh, Bill Clinton's administration. Uh, do you, you remember? You know, yeah, I mean, I remember when the Lewinsky scandal broke, and I mean, it's. I think it's hard for anybody who wasn't alive back then to kind of get the magnitude of just how big that scandal was at the time. And Bill Clinton, I mean, in a press conference, he comes out, and the whole nation is watching him, and he said, "I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky," and. The next day, everybody in the media is parsing this thing out because it was clear that he was playing word games, and and he was spinning, you know. And and then when he finally had the, when he was finally cross examined on all of this, his answer was classic. It all depends on what is is. I mean, what exactly is an unwise decision when it comes to making a decision to spend tithes and offerings to make your pastor a New York Times bestseller? And you know, I mean, it does uh, unwise decision is that a is that a good way to describe it, or is this a, just a euphemism to cover the truth? I think it's an unwise strategy when you get caught, is what I think. Um, you know, previously, and I had I've interviewed Warren Cole Smith, the reporter at World Magazine, who broke the, this story mm-hmm. a couple of times, and and he said yesterday, well, when he initially got this statement from Justin Dean, the spokesman at Mars Hill. 
it was kind of a different tenor to that. It was, well, we were trying to reach more people for Jesus, and, you know, nothing was really wrong with it. And by the time the board statement came out, the wording had changed. It's an unwise strategy. Well, it's a, a lot more than an unwise strategy. It's an unethical strategy. It's an immoral strategy. And, you know, again, it's back to the issue of true repentance, true owning up. If they really wanted to say, boy, we really blew it, they could have used much more straightforward language to convey that. Um, it, it really, it was Clinton-esque. Chris, you've nailed it. I think it was absolutely Clinton-esque. Um, and at the very end of the statement, as you note, uh, they talk about unreservedly backing Mark Driscoll and some of the other executive elders yeah. um, for their humility. You know, I'm like, wow, that's, you're living in some kind of a, an alternate universe because if there's humility and and uh, all kinds of wonderful um, godliness going on. I, I haven't seen it. Um, also, the issue of, you know, bearing up under false accusations. They don't define their terms. That's the other problem with this statement. False accusations. What false accusations? We don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't say. Then they talk about, we embarked on this strategy because outside counsel advised us to do it. Well, who is the outside counsel? Thomas Nelson came back and said it wasn't us. We're yeah. not the ones who advised them to do it. They're the publisher of the book. So they throw in all of these references, and they also talk about it didn't cost as much as has been reported. Well, then how much did it cost? How much did it cost, and where did you get the money? Did you get it from tithes? Did you get it from offerings? Did your congregation know anything about this? Was it in the budget? Was the budget handed out to every single person in the church? You, you actually learn a lot more by what is not said than by what actually was said, in my opinion. Yeah, and it... You know, I, like it's just full of euphemism and kind of misdirection and obfuscation. But what I don't see from Mars Hill, and I've never seen it ever in the years that I've been covering them, I've never seen Driscoll say, "Listen, I sinned. I blew it. Here's what I did wrong. I own my sin. I confess my sin, and I ask." that you forgive me. I've never heard him say that. And yet, yesterday, you sent a link out on Twitter to a, a video where, Mars, where Driscoll, in a, in a sermon, talked about the fact that Christians never confess their sin and own it. And it was, it's bizarre. It's, it, you know, it, you know <laughs> it's hypocritical. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it, it's hypocritical beyond belief. And, and the, the sad part is, and this kind of brings up a point that you brought up a little earlier, is that the world easily sees this for what it is. And un yep. and unfortunately, Christianity, the church, and Jesus have taken a, a pretty severe hit, um, you know, you know, PR hit as a result of this man's behavior. But his continued refusal to not confess his sin, I think, ultimately sends a message to the world. What do you think that, that his in unrepentance and euphemism and misdirection you know what what message does that send to the world regarding christianity at this point oh brother well i think the message it sends to the world is that christianity is just full of scam artists and con men and snake oil salesmen and the people who put up with it are morons people have actually told me that and you know one of the ways that we can glorify god is by those of us who are christians who do have a sense of what is biblical, need to speak up against it and publicly speak up against it and say, this is not the way it ought to be. But you're right, that, that is how the world regards us. When I, and I, you know, I was a journalist for a number of years. I was an editor for seven years. I was a reporter. I was a, uh, went on to be a writer for about 20 years in total. When I was an editor sitting down and reading stories that were going to be published in a newspaper, the two biggest issues for you as an editor are plagiarism and libel. Those are the two biggest things that you look for, because those things will kill you if they get into a newspaper. You can get sued for libel for millions of dollars if you really had shown malice, and plagiarism, uh, same, so same story. So when my friends who are in the journalism world still, and I've talked to a, a number of them who've come out since this story broke, and they're like, how in the world can people in the church not see that this is plagiarism? This is absolute plagiarism. What is wrong with you guys? Yeah. And I have to answer back and go, got me. I, I, I have no idea. And also people in academia. This is clearly plagiarism. If anybody in my class, I teach a college class, if anybody in my class had done something like this, a tenth or a one hundredth of what he did, 
it would bear, it would be an F on the paper and he'd probably get kicked out of the university. It would end you. And the fact that it ends you in the world, look at Shia LaBeouf. This is a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Here is this actor who is plagiarized and then apologizes with another uh, plagiarized apology. He is a joke now. He had to show up at this recent film festival with a bag over his head and say that he's not go- he's not going to be in Hollywood anymore. I mean, he is a laughing stock in the world. But Driscoll does way more than that, and we honor him and throw around the word grace and act as if it pleases Jesus to have somebody who's obviously uh, somebody who has lied and committed fraud and stolen from other people. And that's another issue, too. Where are the men he stole from standing up and saying this is wrong? Yeah. That's another question I have. Yeah, that, that's kind of the, the other angle of all of this, is that the people he's plagiarized have not publicly come out and... and rebuked him for what he's done they've they've remained silent and their silence unfortunately is inter- is interpreted as as a tacit approval or winking at his behavior and it's 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 yeah. beyond me I, i'm worried at this point for the church the reason i'm worried for the church is because the the world the world has more ethics and better values than christians in the church and this cannot end well this is this Things do not go well for a society when the world, people who are dead in trespasses and sins, have more morals, more scruples ethically than the people in the church. This is, I, I, you know, I don't know what this is. I, I, historically, I can't find a parallel in the 2,000-year history of the church, and I've looked for one. I don't know what this is. Um, but I can tell you this, you know, people keep talking about how they're hoping for revival, you know, that God, there's going to be this great outpouring of the Spirit. It's a bunch of nonsense. You want to see revival? It begins in the church with people saying, we have sinned against God by tolerating evil men who are publicly sinning, who are not qualified to be pastors. We've not only tolerated them, we've defended them, and we've attacked those who have brought, who've raised the biblical issue regarding these men, and we repent. Until that happens, there's not going to be revival. It's only going to get worse, and Christianity is going to continue to become more of a moral joke as it slips into just a complete laughing stock of morassness based upon celebrity cults. I mean, it's, ugh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, go, 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 Chris, go. I'm with you. Amen. I, and, and this is the thing. It was funny. I was reading an article not too long ago on the life of Athanasius. Athanasius, the great yeah. defender of biblical orthodoxy, at a time when Arius was coming out and convincing everybody that Jesus was the first being that God created, which was absolutely heresy. Athanasius, and I didn't even realize this until I started reading a little bit more, he endured unbelievable personal attacks from people inside the church. One of the things that they did was they called him divisive. Doesn't that sound familiar, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> it's my, it, hey, listen, and, uh, it's, it's on my job description now. You know, you know d- duties of pirate Christian, <laughs> be divisive. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, and that's the thing. I, I had somebody uh, tell me that they were on a radio show, and the radio host was saying, oh, I don't like that Janet Mufford. She's so divisive. And I said, well, yeah, I, do, I try to divide between truth and error, so yeah. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. But, um, but the point is that God is great, and he is sovereign, and he always has his people. Yeah. No matter how dark the times are, and I think it's important, as we, you and I, Chris, are kind of despairing, like, oh, Lord, this is so bad. We need to remember that God is not surprised by any of this. And frankly, one of the things I've been able to be excited about in the midst of it all is the fact that God is exposing it. He's yeah. exposing it. That is something to rejoice over, because it's something I've been praying for significantly in the last several months especially. Lord, bring hidden sin to light. Now, the issue will be, how will the Church deal with it? Will this result source issue end the ministry of Mark Driscoll, or will he go on supported by other people who want to see him continue on simply because he's Mark? This is a test. I really think it's a test, but I think we can't lose hope. When we look at Luther and the darkness and the corruption of the Catholic Church at the time, sometimes things have to get bad enough that people will come out and say, God help us, this is wrong, we've sinned, we, we need to repent as a church that we have tolerated this, and we have put up with it. And, you know, I just keep praying that the Lord is going to be glorified in all this, and that the truth will continue to come out, but also that the church is going to respond 
correctly. At least, hopefully, some of us will. That's about all we can hope for at this point, I think. Yeah, and I think pointing to Athanasius' story does at least give us a strategy to moving forward because uh, not only was he accused of being divisive, he was basically told by the uh, you know Arius's followers that uh, he needed to give up because the whole world was against him. And Athanasius, Athanasius gave his great reply back. He said, no, the whole world isn't against Athanasius. It's Athanasius contra mundum. It's Athanasius against the yep. world. And, and awesome. I, you know, I feel that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and I'll pray that the Lord gives us the endurance and the ability to do our jobs without losing our love, you know, which is what the uh, Ephesian church uh, lost in their fight for truth when Christ had to rebuke them for that. So, Yeah, good point. And that's, that's it. And I think we continually need to be on our knees, and I do mean literally on our knees, um, that the Lord would clean up his church um, you know, we talk, for example, about the famine in the land, and, and we go back to that Old Testament passage where the hearing of the word of the Lord was hard to find. Yeah. And I think it would be difficult for us to say that we're not in a similar time right now. Yeah. It, it, only the Lord can turn it around. Only He can do it. And you're right, we can't lose our love, we can't lose our hope, we can't lose our faith. We just have to obey the Lord and have the integrity and have the morality and have the honesty that Jesus requires us to have as his disciples. What, what is your hope in all of this? You know, the last question is, you know, what would you ideally like to see happen moving forward with the, uh, with the scandals regarding Driscoll? What would you really, if, you know, if, if God answered your prayer, what prayer would you really like to see answered and play out in front of the whole church at this point regarding all of this? I think Mark Driscoll should step down. I think he should leave the ministry. And I think that it would be a wonderful thing for the people at Mars Hill to reexamine what they've put up with, what they've endured. There have been a lot of staff issues and leadership issues, and we have, what, six or seven elders and staff who have come forward now, Dave Kraft, Jeff Bettner, some other people, Mm -hmm. who have talked about a lot of the crud that's been going on there for a long, long time. I pray for those people. I, I pray that the people in that church would return to the Word of God, and would learn the lesson that if you are a Christian, your only celebrity, and I hate to even use that word, your only uh, admired person ultimately should be the Lord Jesus himself. Right. And you should put yourself under the Word of God first and foremost, and be Bereans. This is something that is so significant. Everybody is under the Word of God. The, the, the disciples didn't have a problem when the Bereans were examining what they were preaching daily to see whether or not it was so. Mm-hmm. They were commended for it. Yep. That's what we need. So my prayer would be he would step down from the ministry and that that church could heal and that church could come back into compliance with the Word of God. And um, that's, that's where I am right now because I think it's really necessary, and I think it would speak volumes to where we really come down as a church on the issue of ethics. I really do. What will happen from here will tell you where American Christianity, or at least the American evangelical movement, is going to go. That's just my, my opinion. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm hoping and praying for as well. And if that doesn't happen, oh man, <laughs> the next, yeah, the next yeah. shoe that drops is going to be worse than this. And uh, yeah, so... Uh, Janet, thank you so much for taking some time today to come on Fighting for the Faith. I really appreciate the work that you're doing, and uh, keep up the fight. Well, likewise, Chris, and I pray for you, and I'm very thankful for how the Lord is using you to stand for truth. We need each other. We're a family. And I'm just thankful. I just want to say thank you to all the listeners of your show as well. You guys are great, and uh, you know, continue to pray for Chris because he's doing some great work here and, and really trying to honor the Lord and do the right thing in the midst of a very difficult time in which we're living. So thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. You're very gracious. And that was my interview recorded earlier today with Janet Mefford. What did you think? Love to get your feedback. If you'd like to email me regarding anything you've heard on this edition or any previous editions of Fighting for the Faith, you can do so. My email address is talkback at fightingforthefaith.com, or you can subscribe on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash pirate Christian. Follow me on Twitter. My name there at pirate Christian. Quick break when we come back. Uh, we will play part one of my interview earlier today with Pastor Matt Richard regarding divisiveness and sound doctrine. Is it divisive to stand up for sound doctrine? Stay tuned. Don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. 
We don't need to rethink Christianity. We need to rediscover it. You're listening to Fighting for the Faith.